Welcome to uh, East Hartford. My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here, um, and uh, I'm glad that uh, we're together today. So, um, we're going to be in the book of Colossians today, uh, continuing a series uh, called um, Rhythms, and we've been talking about the rhythms of our uh, of our lives, um, the rhythm, the rhythms of our relationship with Jesus, and how uh, being a follower of Christ is not uh, about a compartment of your life, but it's about your whole life, and that's kind of what we've been focused on uh, in the last. Um, the last few weeks, and and will be for the next couple, uh, next few more weeks, and and so we're going to be in Colossians today. We're going to be talking about we as a church have this uh, this this um, uh, 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 the, our, our vision, if you will, is is uh, is is kind of said in four L's, four things: living, learning, loving, and leading. Last week I talked about that L of living, and and how sometimes when we think about these four L's. We can think about them as, as compartments of our life. Like I have <clears throat> the living compartment of my life, living in community with other people. And, and that's a portion of my life. That's a compartment of my life. And then learning is another compartment of my life. And, and a lot of times we're focused more on the doing rather than the being. And so last week we talked about being in community, being in, uh, in, in community with other people is an identity that we possess as believers in Christ. It's not something that we do. It's not an event we attend. It's not a, a, a thing that we go to. It's rather a, a thing that we are. And we've talked about this idea that sometimes we have these misconceptions about church and, and, some, and, and a lot of times we even, the way we communicate, like I'm going to church, we often think of church as an address, a building that we go to or as, as a... Uh, uh, an organization that we pay dues to that gives us uh, services or uh, potentially as an event. And I, honestly, I'm leaning, I think our culture leans towards the, 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 the event of church more, or maybe the events that are all labeled part of a church more than any other sort of, of, of misconception of church. Obviously, we believe church, or sometimes we think of church as a building, but most of the time we think like doing something, like going to a place for a particular purpose, like hearing a message preach, singing some songs, praying the prayers, um, going to a Sunday school class, doing things on Wednesday. Like that's church. Like we do those activities and they mark those off the list. Those are calendared activities. And that's, that's the aspect of my life that I spend at church or as the church. But as we talked about last week, church is an identity that we possess Living in community is, is, a, is a rhythm of those that, that, that just like you have rhythms in your life because you have certain things that you are, right? I mean, you are a mom, you are a dad, you are a child, you are a, a, uh, a plumber or a manufacturer, manufacturing worker, whatever it is. And there's particular with rhythms of your life that happen because of the things that you are. In the same way, rhythm, the rhythm of living in gospel community with one another that's because of who you are. You are the children of God. You are saved by God's grace, if that's who you are. See, uh, there's an assumption that, that in that statement, there's an assumption that those in the room today are believers in Jesus Christ. Some of you here today are here because you're not believers in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're, you're on this journey of trying to figure out whether or not you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And I think today will be helpful. I hope today is helpful. Um, today we're going to be talking about learning to follow Jesus. See, sometimes when we, when we use the word learning, we typically automatically, our brain kind of shifts in into normal church mode of saying, okay, learning. We're going to talk about learning. So we're going to talk about church attendance. We're going to talk about Sunday school classes or small groups. We're going to talk about Bible studies, devotional Bible studies, you know, pr prayer time, quiet times in the morning, those kind of things. That's what Jeremy's going to talk about today. But I, I don't want to talk about just though, like those are aspects of growing in Christ. Those are aspects. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> All right, voice, come on. What's going on here? <clears throat> Excuse me. This is between my voice and myself. <laughs> but um, those are aspects of what it means to follow Christ or how we grow in following Christ. But growing in Christ is a, is a rhythm of our lives. Learning to follow Christ is a rhythm of our life. Let me, now that's, that's where we're going to go today in Colossians chapter 3. So 
just to kind of give us a visualization, if you look at this, this screen here, to, this is uh, something I shared with our church um, over almost, it was, it was two years ago now, and, uh, and, and, and one of my first sermon series here, we talked about vision, we talked about living, learning, loving, and leading, and not compartments of your life, but as the holistic idea of all these things to be true of your life. You need to be living in gospel community, you need to be learning uh, to follow Jesus in everyday stuff of your life, you need to be loving people as you are going and leading others to Christ as you are living your life. Those are aspects of a growing disciple's life and a growing church's life. So with that kind of as our understanding, we're going to read Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. But before I do that, I need to give you guys some parameters, okay? Can you, can you, you guys bear with me on that? So there's temptations that you'll find in this text as you read it, okay? And this is true really of any text that we read in Scripture, but I think it's particularly true of this passage as we are looking at it today. So the temptations of the text is what I want to start off before I even read it. I want to tell you guys of some things that are tempting to you as, as, as we're reading, or tempted to me, tempting to all of us as we read this passage. First thing is because of our limitations, is, before I say this, does anybody in this room read Koine Greek? Like are you pretty good with reading Koine Greek? Anybody? I'm not raising my hand because I am, okay, because I do not know how to read. I did four years of, no joke, seriously, four years, two in college, two in seminary, and still I am like dependent on Greek dictionaries and concordances, okay? So, but anyway, so nobody, nobody can read Greek, so we got that out of the equation, out of the, out of the picture. So we have a limitation, because everything that we are reading in Scripture is translated from a different language. And because of that, we don't always catch certain things that are important for us to understand in the text. Now, the, the way we, we counter this is, and this is for you guys to take home with you, is read multiple translations of the, of the Bible. So if you're, if you're studying the Bible, read the NIV version, the ESV version, the CSV version, the New Living Translate, whatever you have. Like, read at least three translations of the same passage in order for you to understand. That will kind of give you a glimpse at potentially different nuances of words, okay? So, that's your little help. But because we have that limitation, when you read this passage, you're going to see the word you a lot and, and assume that it's, a, it's written singularly. It's meaning that it's written to individuals. And so when we read it, we're going to read it singularly rather than plural, plurally. And I know English people, I know that's probably not a word, but I struggled this week trying to figure it out. But I just came up with plurally, okay? And, and my, my word said, no, that's not a word. That's not. And I said, word, I don't care. Microsoft, you're not the boss of me, okay? And so that's what I did. So we'll read this singularly rather than plurally, or we'll read it individualist, this individualistically rather than communally. That might be a better way of saying it, right? So we make our learning to follow Jesus a personal journey. So when you read this passage, you could be tempted to say, oh, well, this is my personal journey. But that's not how Paul wrote this book. And not how Paul wrote this letter. He did not intend on us learning to follow Jesus by ourselves. That's a temptation you're going to have in reading this passage. So next temptation you're going to have is you're going to pay attention only to the imperatives. This is our temptation to pay attention only or at least exclusively or, or primarily to the imperatives, the things we should do. Okay, imperatives are like do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that. That's an imperative. Okay, the the action statements, the verbs of what we are supposed to do, and you're going to have the temptation to ignore the indicatives. Indicatives are who we are. Okay, these are the defining characteristics who we are in Christ. So, so what you're going to do then is so you're going to make learning to follow Jesus a set, a simply a, a, a list or a simply following a set of rules. So, like, if, if you're just focused on the imperatives, it's going to be like looking through, like, weeding through all the statements about who you are and just looking for what do I need to do, right? And that's our tendency as human beings, especially in the Western culture that we live in. We just want to be told what to do. Okay, give me a book with 10 points in it on how I should be a better Christian, and I'll do those things. But it doesn't work like that. 
it's never worked like that. From the very beginning, God didn't create us to just be doers. He created us to be beers. And our being will, will precede our doing. Who, what we do will be, uh, will be uh, directed by who we are. That's just the way things work. So, that's the, second, um, that's the second thing. Paying attention only to the imperatives and ignoring the indicatives and simply following a set of rules and not really following uh, Christ as uh, the one who defines you. So the next one is to understand the concepts of knowledge, wisdom, and the word of Christ. These are all words that are used in this passage. Knowledge, wisdom, and the word of Christ to mean something we gain primarily in a classroom setting or church service. So to make discipleship event-oriented rather than rhythms of our everyday life. Let me tell you what I'm saying there. So typically when you hear the word knowledge, growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom, learning, or like make dwelling, the word of God dwelling in your hearts. Like we as church people function, like we shift into, okay, I need to join a Bible study, Sunday school class. I need to read my Bible every day. I need to do these things like, and, and it's more event oriented things rather than making following Jesus and learning and knowledge and wisdom dwelling in your hearts and a, a, a rhythm of your everyday life. Like literally what Paul intends for us to understand here is learning to follow Christ happens as much at your workplace and at your home place and with your buddies, it should, as it does when you're at a church service. Or when you're in a Sunday school class or Bible study or whatever it is. I'm not saying don't go to church services. I'm not saying don't join Bible studies. I'm not saying don't read your Bible in the morning before you go to work. I'm saying don't think about discipleship, growing as a follower of Christ, as, a, as only happening in events and in like particular circumstances. Learning to follow Christ is something we need to happen in every aspect of our lives. So, those are all things I want you to know before we read the passage, okay? Because as we read this passage, when I say the word you, I want y'all to say y'all, okay, in your brains. Not literally out loud, because that's going to really interfere with my reading. But if you, if as I'm reading it, think of these as, 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 as words that should, we should think of communally, not as individuals. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so, um, and I, I can't help it, but I got to stop a couple times and just give you an indication or uh, an ex a, a explanation of what Paul's doing. Okay, so just bear with me. I know it's like just get on with it, but it's important, and I, and I hope it's impactful. Okay, here. So it says, "If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God." Okay, I've got to stop there real quick. So whenever you see the "if" statement, a lot of times that is a, a place in the Bible where this indicative imperative sort of thing is happening, okay? And this is one of those examples. It's an if-then statement. Now, the, the first two words of the passage is if-then, but don't get confused with that's not the then that you need to be focused on, okay? So the if here is if you have been raised with Christ. That is a indicative statement. What I mean by that is what Paul is saying is if what is true of you is you have been raised with Christ. What does it mean to be raised with Christ? It means to be saved. See, what, what the Bible says is when we trust in Christ, when we give our hearts and our lives to Jesus, when we ask him to be the Lord and Savior of our life, we die to our old self and then we're risen to a new life. That's the language that's used all throughout Scripture. Nicodemus and Jesus in the garden, or uh, in, in, uh, late at night in, uh, in the book of John, not in the garden, it was, in, uh, it was not in the garden. But anyway, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, how do I get saved? And Jesus says, you must be born again, right? And then later on, Paul translates that in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, behold, or he says, you have died to your old self and behold, the new self has come. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? Like there's all kinds of indications that what happens in us when we're saved is we die to our old self and are raised to new life in Christ. And so that's an identity that we possess. And so what Paul is saying is if that is the identity that you possess, this should be what you should do. Now the imperative statement, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You see where the he's saying to, to us as people, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you are saved, then your focus should be on heavenly things, not earthly things. 
That's the, that's the indicative imperative. See, some of us in the room, we don't know Jesus. We think we know Jesus, but we don't know Jesus. And so we're trying to focus on heavenly things, but we don't understand the heavenly things because they're hidden like a veil and covering our eyes. That's why God brought you here today so that you would give your life and your heart to Jesus so that you can focus on heavenly heaven reality. See, your idea is if I do these things, then God's going to be happy with me. And the reality is that's a worldly perspective. In order for you to understand the heavenly perspective, you have to receive the love of Jesus. And it's a, it's a free offer. Like it's not something you have to work towards. It's not something you have to give more money towards. It's not something you have to attend something in order to receive. The offer is that whoever would trust in Christ Jesus would receive the love of Christ and be transformed so that they can have a heavenly perspective. It's not an earthly transaction. It's a heavenly transaction that requires nothing on our part besides faith. Trust in Jesus. You receive salvation. And now your life is sealed with Christ. As he says, it's hidden with Christ. See, verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's a reality for us. That's the indicative imperative. So, I need to keep going. So, Again, another in, uh, imperative, set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. The in, in, indicative, for you have died with in your for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Keep on going. When Christ is your life, when Christ who is your life appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passions, um evil desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you, lit, when you were living in them. But now you have put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all... <clears throat> But above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Let me say a prayer. Lord Jesus, I do pray, God, that you would guide us through this passage, help us to understand what you intend and what you desire for our lives, God. And help us to be transformed, God. Help us, our, our minds, our hearts, our, our longings be transformed, God. I am entirely dependent on you, God. I know that my words, Father, are pointless and powerless, uh, God. But your words are, are transformative, God. And they have so much purpose and meaning and significance. And so let, let us be transformed by them in this time we have to get, today uh, to share together, God. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Following Jesus. Learning to follow Jesus is the process of discipleship. What the word disciple is, is a follower. Um, and, and a follower is, <clears throat> is in, in this culture, there was disciples of all kinds of people. So a disciple was one that followed around a master teacher. <clears throat> And so the master teacher wasn't like, it wasn't like hours in the day. Like you go to school eight to three or eight to five, whatever. Like you as a disciple would follow around this master and learn his ways. And he would teach you as he goes. That's what discipleship was in Jesus's time. And so when you're called a, a disciple of Jesus, I, I, what you're doing is you're learning to follow Jesus. 
We don't have a physical Jesus to follow. The physical Jesus is in heaven with God and he will one day return uh, on a white stallion with a big sword coming out of his mouth. It's going to be awesome. I don't really know what it's going to look like, but it's going to be awesome. And, but until that time, the way we follow Jesus is by knowing and following his word. And so when we think about discipleship, making, being and making disciples, because this is the important point. When we're going through these principles and these understandings of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, this is not just for you to say, okay, Okay, am I a disciple? But it's also to say, am, is my children, are my children disciples? I know they, gave, they came to Christ. They, they trusted in Jesus. They, they gave their life to Jesus. They walked an aisle. They got baptized. They did the whole thing. But are they following Jesus? Not just saved, but following Jesus. <clears throat> and if they are following Jesus, what are those indicators? And so this is about making, being and making disciples. So what is it? What is discipleship? First off, discipleship is life altering. Discipleship is life altering. I've kind of already hinted at this, but if you look at verses one through four, it says, if you, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things on the earth. See, when we come to Christ, it's life altering because the purpose and the direction of our life is transformed and shifted. Some of you have tr testimonies of how, like, you were on this trajectory. This is my testimony. I was on this trajectory in my life. I wanted a pretty wife, a nice car, a good job, and the ability to go on vacation, and all of those things. The only thing I got is a pretty wife. That's the only thing I got out of the whole thing. Um, and I got a good job, but it just doesn't pay like an architect, okay? That's the whole deal. And so, but God changed the trajectory and direction of my life, right? Because the things that I valued prior to knowing Christ are no longer the things that that I value in this life. Now, I still struggle with some of those things, but at the end of the day, I know that my life is hidden with Christ in God, and that's what matters the most, right? And so, he says, set your minds on the things above, not on the things below. What are the things above? Look at verse 4. I love verse 4. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears. See, this is the thing I don't think we quite get as believers. You didn't just get saved. You got bought. Okay? You didn't get, just get saved. Like your sins didn't just get paid for, but you literally got bought. So Jesus owns you if you're a Christian. And that's good news. That's not bad news. It's not like, oh man, I don't want to be owned by Jesus. Well, then you're owned by Satan. So either way, like one, which one you want to be owned by? You're going to be used for his purposes or you're going to be used for Christ's purposes. Which ones are the more important? The ones that are going to fulfill you are the Christ's purposes. Because it says when he, like when Christ who is your life appears, what does it say there? He says, uh, uh, he says, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the direction of our lives. Anybody have a GPS that uses it all the time, even if they're going to Walmart and Beaver Dam? I do it. I just want to know how long it's going to take me, right? I want to make sure there's no traffic in Hartford. No, seriously, I do use it too often because I want to know, like, where am I going? And I, I, she uses her iPad. But it, where you're going, and, she, and you want to know, like, how long it's going to take me to get there, right? Is there any traffic jams along the way, right? Wouldn't that be really cool to have, if, if, like, in our journeys with Christ? See, the thing is, Jesus is, like, the journey with Christ is more like the, the, the GPS units from the early 2000s when they didn't have the traffic updates, right? And so it was telling you, you just got to go through this place, and you'll get there, and, and it'll be great. My dad followed a GPS one time. I told him, I said, don't go through Chicago. He was coming to North Dakota. He said, I said, don't go through Chicago. He's like, I'm just going to follow the GPS. And literally, he drove by the Sears Tower, like, 4.30 in the afternoon. He said, I'm not doing that on the way back. And I'm like, I told you, Daddy. It doesn't always follow. It. But see, this is the thing. If we, if, if the GPS of our life, is, it's got a destination. And the destination is when Christ appears, who is your life, then you get to appear with him in glory. That's the goal of your life, not a successful business, not really healthy kids, not uh, and, and, uh, whatever this, this direction that you want to. It, see, our lives... I have a, has the destination to find our fulfillment in who Christ created us and saved us to be, and that is to be his brothers and sisters in glory with him. And so our trajectory is that, and so we keep our heavenly focus is what his Paul is telling us here. And that's all a product of discipleship. See, discipleship is a continual like refocusing on the thing that matters the most, and that's Jesus in life with him. 
And all kinds of things are going to distract you. Circumstances in life are going to distract you. There's going to be opportunities in life that are going to distract you. Some of you today are pursuing these opportunities because God has, has brought them to you. And in actuality, they're distracting you from the thing that matters most, and that's following Christ. Sometimes I'm like sitting back thinking, that's going to end, that's not going to end well. When I hear what people have, how people are, and, and even my own, like I look back and I'm like, why did I think that was going to end well? Because I wasn't focused on the things in, in uh, the, the things in heaven. I was focused on the things right now. This whole Kanye West thing is, is a great indication. I don't know if you guys know who Kanye West. I had a lady come up to me after the service, and, and she's, um, she's not young. And she said, I don't know who that Kanye West or whatever his name was. I don't even know who that was. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I probably should give a little bit more. But Kanye West is a, a hip-hop artist um, who has been around since the early 2000s and really is probably, I don't, I never really liked him very much, but he's probably top of the shelf when it comes to hip-hop artists in the secular world. Everything that he puts out is automatically platinum albums, like he Grammys and all that kind of stuff. And and Kanye, I've used him in sermon illustrations before. Actually, early on in my, uh, in my time here at HBC, I used him in a sermon illustration to illustrate the like the epitome of pride uh, in in the world that we live in, and that was Kanye, and that and, and, and Kanye probably still struggles, but but Kanye West over the last year has gone through a life transformation. Of all indications, would say that Kanye West has has gone through a life translation transition. A, a transformation. Just a few weeks ago, just a couple weeks ago, he dropped an album called "Jesus Is King." And that's pretty incredible because in 2013, he put out an album called Jesus. And one of the tracks on the album was called I Am A God. And that pretty much summed up Kanye's life. Like Kanye thought of himself as a God. He pretty much lived above anybody else and he thought he could do basically anything that he wanted to do. He had all kinds of money, all kinds of power, all kinds of significant influence and things. And so he would, he lived in that. And every time you heard him talk, it's like, this guy is so full of himself. Like, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. But then oh, at last, I think he points it back to April. He had a life changing experience with Christ. And, and he wrote this album. He put this album out. It's called Jesus is King because he believes Jesus is the king of his life. I've heard him say it. And I've listened to a few interviews. And, and it's, it's incredible to hear this man like that understands. Like he has conviction of sin in his life. He, in one interview, the guy talked to him about living in L.A. And he says, I struggle being in L.A. because all the billboards in the culture, it's just this like this sexualized culture. And, and, and I've always struggled. I've struggled with pornography for a long time in my life. And he's just confessing his sin to this secular media guy. And I'm like, this guy, like, this guy knows what it means to be convicted of sin in his life. And he's killing it in his life. His, and his, and the, the major thing is like, he sees one of the Christian hip hop artists that I really like, his name is Shy Lin. He says, um, he says about Kanye's conversion, he is excited because he sees that God is still in the business of saving and that he takes blasphemous lips and turns them into instruments for his peace. See, Kanye's perspective is no longer on, I mean, it's still, I'm still, we all struggle every day, right? But his, his, his perspective is shifting from this earth-centered, worldly perspective of gaining wealth and power here, and it's shifting to my significance in life is only measured by what I do for Christ in this world. See, discipleship absolutely transforms your life. It's life-altering. Discipleship also calls for continual killing of sin. If you look at verse 5, there's a transition that happens, right? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Then it says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Then he lists a group of sins, sexual sin, covetedness, idolatry, and passion, evil desires. Then he goes to another list of anger, malice, wrath, slander, obscene talk from your, all these different things, lying, uh, not forgiving other people, all these different things, right? So the Puritan John Owen, he's a, he's a, a pastor back in the 1800s. John Owen wrote a book called The Mortification of Sin. That word mortification, is a, it's a combining of two Latin words, the first word death and the second word to do. So in a sense, what the word mortification means is to put something to death or more literally to make dead. 
John Owen wrote a book all about making sin dead. Listen, I hate spiders. And so when I see a spider in my house, I make it dead. Like real bad. Like I stomp it and I squish it and then I flush it. Like every time, like I'm, it's going to be dead. I don't want a leg to me moving on this spider. Okay. Cause I don't like spiders. And that's what, that's what, that's what John Owen's book. That's what Paul is telling us here is we got to make sin dead in our lives. Disciples of Christ make sin. Discipleship is the process of making sin dead in your life. Okay. And so what John Owen said is be killing sin or can, sin will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. How do we kill sin in our lives? See, I think when we look at this passage, see, he says, put to death, therefore sin is earthly in you. And then he starts naming them. What Paul is trying to do is hit your sin. Anytime you see a list of sins, Paul is trying to hit your sin. And he kind of leaves them broad. Like sexual immorality includes adultery. It includes sex outside of marriage. It includes living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It also includes um, uh, pornography, uh, the, the viewing of and acting out on pornography. It includes all of those things. He kind of lumps all those sins into one, right? Because he wants to hit the target, right? He says, um, he says sexual immorality, impurity, passion... And you're like, passion, what's like passion is the pursuit of your worldly passion, like the desires of your body, right? I mean, that can be sex, that can be alcohol, that can be drugs, that can be all kinds of different things, but the passions of the flesh, right? He says evil desires, covetedness. Covetedness is wanting something that your neighbor has, right? And then he puts a sidebar on that, which is idolatry, which means that you worship something that's not God. That's kind of the all-encompassing. Like if I didn't hit you on the other ones, got you there, okay? That's what Paul's trying to do. Then he, he talks about anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Um, and he says, do not lie to one another. See, what Paul's doing, he's listing all these things and he's saying, did I get you? And everybody in the room's like, yeah, you got me. He got me a couple times. Did he get you guys? See, this is the reality. What Paul, like, if we're going to fight sin, if we're going to kill sin in our life, the first thing we have to do is acknowledge sin. If you're in this room today and you have all kinds of excuses why you view pornography, you can't kill your sin. If you have all kinds of reasons that you have malice or anger or slander in your life, well, did you see what they did to me? Well, work's just been really tough lately, and I'd come home, and just things were out of whack, and so I snap at my wife or my kids. So it's justifiable. If you're not acknowledging it as sin, then you can't kill it. I mean, if there's a spider on my wall, and I walk by, and I'm like, I don't think that's a spider. I don't think that's a spider. I don't think that's a spider. I cannot do that. I can't. Because if I see it and, it and it looks like a spider, even if it's like maybe not a spider, but it looks like one, like it's a fuzzball, I'm going to kill that fuzzball too. <laughs> I'm going to murder it. Like I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that fuzzball does not live. <laughs> and that's what, that's, see, that's the thing. I have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge that it's sin in order to kill it. So stop justifying your sin. Stop saying, well, I think God would be all right with this. No, he's not. He wants you to kill it. Stop, just acknowledge your sin. Then confess your sin. Bring it to the light. That's what Paul says, uh, or that's what John says. He says, confess your sins because God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes, your sin is weighty and it's heavy and it's gross and it makes you feel shame. It makes you feel regret and all those things. And so he says, confess it, bring it to the light so that you can deal with it. Jesus says in John chapter 3, after he talks to Nicodemus, you're died and you know, you got born again. He says, hey, listen, Jesus, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Do you understand that? Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. This is Jesus' purpose statement. He came to save us. He says, some of us, we want to stay in the darkness. Read this in John chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Okay, and so, or maybe 17 through 20. I might have got the, the one off there. But anyway, he says that, that those who remain in the darkness, they're, they're, they don't want to go to the light. Because if they go to the light, their sins would be exposed. Going to the light is confession. Going to the light is acknowledgement of your sin. If you've never done that, if you're sitting here today and you've never acknowledged that you're a sinner in need of grace, 
then you're not saved. Because it requires that we bring our sins to light. I, 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 I need Jesus. Jesus died to forgive you of your sins. If you're unwilling to admit that you're a sinner, then Jesus didn't die for you. Because you're good. Okay? So, um, so confess it. See, James, uh, John says, confess your sins to God. He's faithful and just forgive your sins. And that's, it, sometimes that's easier, isn't it? Like if I'm struggling with sin, like I can confess it to God and like feel good about myself. But why does James have to step in and make everything harder? You know what I'm saying? The, the, the writer of James, Jesus' brother, he always steps in and make things harder, right? James says that without, without works, your faith is dead. Like, J come on, James, make it a little easier on us, right? But no, James has our hearts in mind, right? See, John says, confess your sins. He's faithful and just for you. G, John say, or James says this, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. James chapter 5 verse 16. James, why you got to make it so difficult? Right? Are you guys with me? I can tell my, I can tell God, but now I got to confess it to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, you do. James desire is for our hearts because he knows that if I just confess my sins to God and then I erase my web history and erase my search history, then nobody has to know about it. Just me and God. Right. See, we, we, if, like, we can hide from our sins from other people and still live in them. We know we can't hide from God because he's, he's in all and over all. And so he sees everything. And so it's, it's, but it's easy to hide from one another, right? And act like everything's going fine. But he says, confess them to one another as well. So, acknowledge your sin, confess your sin, and repent of your sin. The word repentance, biblical repentance, is not white-knuckling your sin. Meaning that you work really hard not to do it anymore. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is turning away from something towards something better. Some, turning away from sin that you're pursuing to satisfy the longings of your heart and turning to something that will actually satisfy you. That's what repentance is. That's how you kill sin. And that's what he says. He says, put on or put off, take off, destroy, kill sin and the things of this world. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then verse 12, put on then as chosen, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one. He says, take off the things that are hindering you from following Jesus and put on the things that are the indicators of whether or not you are following Jesus. So we go from this, uh, this discipleship is a killing of sin to discipleship is an active reformation of your character, an active reforming of your character. And that's what's going to happen to each and every one of us if we've trusted in Christ is we're going to have an active reforming of our character, a, a process of reforming. That's the word sanctification, being made holy, being conformed into the image of Christ. We are going to look more and more like Jesus, who was meek and humble and compassionate and kind and patient and bared with those that, uh, that he was with and, uh, and, and was forgiving, right? And we're even told, forgive like Jesus forgave. You have no excuse not to forgive people because Jesus forgave, right? So discipleship is active reformation of character. Put on then as God's chosen one. See, this is another indicative imperative thing here. So the first thing is put on. That's a, a, that's a imperative. But it's, but then he uses the word as. So put on. We often think, okay, well, I got to be a good person. No, you have to realize who you are. You can't put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and bear with others. If what's true of the second, as God's chosen and the holy and beloved, you can't put on those things unless that indicative is true of you. 
Now, you can be a good person and not know Jesus. There can be some good qualities about you. But the reality is, if you are a chosen one of God, what's happened is God has looked at you in all of your sinfulness and all of your wretchedness, and he didn't see anything good in you at all. But nonetheless, he chose you and he saved you. And he brought you into his family. Some of you in this room today, that's what God is doing right now. He is, re- he is showing you that you are not righteous, that you are deserving of his full and complete wrath because of your sinfulness. And he's saying, but listen, that doesn't have to be your story. You don't have to end there. Come to me. Come to me and receive the love and salvation that I am offering you. And be changed and transformed. See, the killing of sin in our lives allows for the opportunity for godly character to grow up in our lives. Who we are in Christ drives what we do here. As chosen ones, because God has saw fit in his sovereign wisdom and abounding love to choose you in the depths of your sin, your holiness and your belovedness, being beloved children of God, are byproducts of his divine election, him calling you to come follow him. So out of the identity of being a chosen, holy, and beloved child of God, may your life be marked by these compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, suffering, long-suffering, forgiveness, and most importantly, love. But notice something about each one of those things. And this kind of these two kind of work alongside each other. See, if you're going to be a disciple of, of, of Christ, if you're going to be a growing follower of Christ, then your life needs to be in a constant reformation, a reforming of your life into the image of Christ. And that's all of us together. And it requires community in order for that to happen. So the next thing is discipleship is nurtured in the context of community. Back to verses 12 through 16. If you look at each one of the characteristics, imperatives, or 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 uh, indicatives in this, they're all in the plural tense. Every one of them. It's not singular. It's plural. You all, y'all, you guys, you ins, whatever you want to say, y'all, all should do these things, should be these things, are these things if you are in Christ Jesus. Matt Chandler points this out. He says, if you look at the list of what we are to put on, they are impossible to put on in private or in isolation or simply as individuals. Whether or not compassion, mercy, and love are there is revealed in community, not in isolation. Our character and our legitimacy of a salvation that we have is tested in the relationships that we have with one another. How do you know if you put on these characteristics unless you're in community with other people? How do you know if you're learning to be more like Jesus if you're in isolation by yourself? Listen, East Hartford Baptist Church, we may broad, we may put our sermons online or you can listen to them later, but we will never have an internet campus. We will never have an internet pastor. Because you cannot grow as a disciple of Jesus in a chat room. There's aspects of your life that can be educated and, and connected, but you cannot grow in Christ unless you're in community with other people. And until I'm, it's proven to me by scientific evidence that Twitter and Facebook and social media platforms is the same thing as getting a hug from someone when you're suffering, then that ain't going to be the direction that we go. See, discipleship, being a disciple of Christ, growing and following Jesus happens in community. You put off the old and you put on the new in community. He says it, verse 16, look at it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. What he says is, us as a people, everybody in this room, let the word of Christ, let it live in us. Don't have a really good quiet time. It's not about having a good quiet time. It's not about going to church. It's not about doing more Bible studies and all that kind of stuff. Those are all good things. But it's letting the word of Christ dwell in us, make its home in us, abide in us. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. John 15, right? And what Jesus says, if if my words abide in you, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He didn't say it in that. I merged two passages together, but you get the gist of it, right? 
We've got to let the word of God live in us so that we can teach and admonish one another. We can teach one another, not just on Sunday mornings or in Sunday school classes. Those are important. But in the everyday stuff of life, your role as a parent is not to send your kid to church so that they can learn the things of Jesus. It's in the midst of the everyday for you to walk along your children and tell them how Jesus is impacting their life. Discipline them under the authority and by the direction of the word of Christ. Your wife and your husband, the way you grow in your marriage is by growing in understanding of God's word, the wisdom of Christ, the knowledge of Christ, the word of Christ. See, this this word is let the word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Let your songs, the psalms, the hymns, the spiritual songs, let's sing them out together. The reason we sing on Sunday mornings is not because that's what you're supposed to do in church. No, we're singing the truths of God. Let them move your hearts. I've already said the second one. The next one is discipleship is guided and shaped by the word. I've already preached that. I skip verse 15 because I want to end with verse 15. But verse, verse 16 and 17, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and, and uh, uh, teach and admonish one another. He says, um, uh, in, with, with, another, um, with all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let your life be defined by the word of Christ. When you make financial decisions in your life, let it be decided by the word of Christ. Not what feels good. And then um, finally, discipleship is marked by a growing satisfaction and gratefulness to Christ. And, and this really is the definition of, of repentance. What I mean by that is what repentance is, is a turning away from one thing and a turning towards something else. Christian repentance is a turning away from the emptiness of sin and a turning into the fullness of Christ. That word peace is the same word that would be translated in, into Hebrew as shalom. And shalom is, is peace, the word peace in Hebrew, which doesn't mean the absence of conflict or the absence of war. It means wholeness, completeness, and harmony. So what he's saying is, let your, let your, your hearts, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the shalom, the harmony, the completeness, the, the satisfaction of Christ rule your hearts. Stop chasing after things that are going to lead to nowhere and start chasing the things that are absolute, that actually matter. How much time do you waste? How much energy do you waste? How much anxiety do you have over things that don't matter? And yet the completeness and harmony of Christ, that's really where joy and, and fulfillment is actually found. See, Discipleship is ultimately a letting Jesus be in us all that we need. And repentance is ultimately a word prompted, community nurtured, turning away from sin and to the all sufficient Savior who is all that we need. That's discipleship, folks. That's what it means to learn to follow Jesus. It means learning his word so much that you just need it. See, most of us, we think if I just read the Bible, then good things are going to happen in my life. It's not true. Sometimes you need to read the Bible because really awful things are going to happen in your life. And you need a heavenly perspective so you don't get lost in the weeds. Some of us, if circumstances in my life were different, then it would be easy to follow Jesus. And Jesus is, is just the same lady came up to me about Kanye. She said, my family, it's like we're in the book of Job right now. Because everything seemed to be going, to, just, just falling apart in my life, in our lives, like health and family and all these different things. 
And, 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 but I know, like, I know at the end of the day, she's just like Job. She says, the Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the reason that she says that is because she knows, she knows, and the, she knows about the peace of Christ. And that peace of Christ, it rules in her heart. Does the peace of Christ rule in your heart? Is your life defined by peace? Or is it chaos? Going to this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing and never finding true fulfillment. Is that you? See, the cool thing about this letter is it continues and he applies all that he said in the rest of the letter. Rules for Christian households, further instructions. Like he kind of gets real practical after this. And I think the reason he does that is he realizes discipleship is not something that happens in a room. Discipleship is ha something that happens in the everyday stuff of your life. And the first step towards disciple, being a disciple of Jesus, is giving up. Giving up the fight to find your joy, find your satisfaction, and find your fulfillment in anything other than Jesus. So in just a second, we're going to sing about hungering and thirsting for Christ. And I want this to be a prayer to us, okay? Because today, some of you are in this room today, and in, at the end of the day, the thing that you've been longing for and all of the thing you've been fighting for, the thing you've been, you've been turning over stones to try to find, you've not found it yet. And I'm going to tell you, the only place you're going to find it is in Jesus. So give up. Trust Him. And begin to walk with Him. And for us Christians, we just need that reminder. To set our, thing, set our minds, not on the things of this earth, but the things of in heaven. And to put our, fix our gaze on Jesus. Let the peace of Christ rule in us richly. And let the word of Christ dwell in us. That's actually the richly one. But either, either way. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, I do pray that that would be us. God, that we, God would be people that are defined by peace. The peace of Christ that dwells in our hearts, that, that rules in our hearts. And the word of Christ that dwells in us deeply, God, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. God, that we would realize the thing that we're hungering and thirsting for the most in our life is not um, better circumstances or more money or, 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 or a better relationship with our husband or our wife or our kids to listen to us and obey us or our kids to be happy, happy healthy, and wise or whatever it might be, God. But the thing we're hungering for the most is, is a clearer picture of who Jesus is and for us to find our joy and our satisfaction and, our, and, our, and, and, and who we are in him. So God, thank you for your grace. Help us as we, as we respond right now, as we think, as we pray, as we respond to you in whatever way that we are led today. Help us in that. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.